English for Construction Course Book, Level 2, by Evan Frendo. Published by Pearson. Unit 1. Teamwork. Recording 2. So, how can I help you? Well, we'd like some background information about the project. OK. I can ask my assistant to send you some details. We sent out a press release a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we have a copy of that, thank you. We're interested in finding out more information about the people working here. How many workers do you have on site? What do they do? Where are they from? Are they all local people? Oh, that depends on what's happening. As you can imagine, this is quite a complex business, so we have different subcontractors and suppliers coming in and out all the time. OK. But to answer your question, I'd say we usually have about a hundred people on site, and they're mostly from this area. And you're in charge of the site? Well, yes. My company, actually my father's company, is the general contractor for the project. We coordinate all the subcontractors and make sure things stay on schedule and stay within budget. I report to the project manager, Sabina Tom. I see. And your father is Kasper Karp? Yes, that's right. Sometimes, on bigger projects, we work in a consortium with other contractors and companies. Could you tell us something about... Excuse me, I've just seen Mr Lang. He's walking through the gate. He represents the client and I have a meeting with him and Anna Black in a few minutes' time. Anna Black? Anna works for the cement supplier, DKI Cement. They're supplying all the cement for the project. Just a moment, please. My assistant, Robert Lane, will answer any further questions you have. Thank, Thank you. you. Unit 1. Recording 3. 1. My role is to make sure that all the project managers have the support they need for materials and equipment. We have a fleet of vehicles which the project managers and site managers use, and I also liaise with many different suppliers. 2. There are only five people in my department, two lawyers and three assistants. We handle all the contracts and claims. 3. My department works with all the other departments. The project managers work for me, but the people in the project teams come from the other departments. These teams change as the project goes through different phases. 4. Our main role is to work with the clients and our management to plan the projects and work out costs. We also help to look for new clients. 5. Our main task is to look after all the income and outgoings in the company. So we send out the bills to our clients and pay the suppliers. 6. We are the technical department. We do the maths and make sure that things work the way they should. We work a lot with operations and also business development. 7. We help to recruit new staff and deal with training and development. We are also responsible for paying expenses and paying wages and salaries. Unit 1. Recording 4. 1. So let me go over some general points. OK. So, we start work every morning between 7 and 9. You must be in by 9, OK? Yes, that's fine. Now then, your office is being renovated. So for the first couple of weeks, you'll be in the site manager's office. They have a spare desk. 
You'll be able to move into your office with the other engineers at the beginning of April. It's open plan and very nice. There are new desks, new computers, even new plants. <laughs> Great.、Um, any idea what CAD software we use? No, sorry. You'll have to ask Joseph. He's responsible for IT. He'll give you your password. Make sure you have all the right software. That sort of thing. Okay.、Um, it's very different to university. <laughs> yes, I'm sure it is. Okay. I think that's about it. Any other questions?、Uh, yes. Could you tell me about parking? Do I need a pass or anything? Yes. Yes, you do. Speak to Rosa. She'll fix that for you. Okay. Thank you. Two. Let's see. I normally work around forty hours a week. What time do you start work? Every day is different. It depends on what's happening on the site. There's quite a lot of overtime, especially in the summer. How did you get into this job? I started as a clerk in an office. I didn't like that. I wanted an outdoor job. So when I was twenty, I got a job as a labourer on construction sites. After a year, I got onto an apprenticeship program that took three years. I was sponsored by a local contractor. I spent twenty years working on large projects like hospitals, schools, and factories. It's a hard physical job. I also have to bend a lot and lift things, and I spend a lot of time on my knees. I usually wear knee pads to protect my knees. A lot of the work is outside, so bad weather sometimes stops us working. Where do you work now? I'm self-employed now. I have two assistants. And we do small jobs like driveways, pavements, that kind of thing. Three. I really do three things in my job. I measure dimensions of buildings. I work out where boundaries are, in other words, where one property ends and another begins. And I look at the land and record details of topographic features like hills and slopes. I have an office, but I spend most of my time outdoors. Do you use any special equipment? I use GPS, which tells me my exact location, and of course I use a total station. I often use GIS applications, which help me analyze my data. Sorry, what's GIS?、Uh, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. How did you get into this job? I was good at maths at school, especially algebra and trigonometry. I liked computers and software, and I wanted a job outdoors. I had a summer job on a construction site when I was a teenager. And I looked at all the different jobs. This one looked good. Unit two, design, recording five. Right. So let's look at the floor plan. As you can see, the house is twenty-eight foot long and twenty foot wide. This gives a total area of five hundred and sixty square feet. The main room with the kitchen is sixteen by twenty foot. The bedroom is twelve by fourteen foot, and the bathroom is six by fourteen foot. Note that all these dimensions are within a tolerance of plus. Or minus one inch. The rooms are standard height, eight feet. The doors are all the same, two foot eight or thirty-two inches wide, and six foot eight high, not including the frames. 
Please note that these drawings are not to scale, so the dimensions are for guidance only. Unit 2. Recording 6. First, we look at various documents, such as preliminary specifications, drawings, utility requirements and so on. Anything which can give us relevant information. We then calculate our initial estimate. As the design moves on into specific details, for example, floor plans, fittings, we get more accurate. This means we include cost of labour, materials and plant, subcontractor quotes and overheads. That's things like legal fees, building permits, on-site temporary construction, transport and so on. We even allow for stoppages due to weather. For example, if it snows, we can't work on roofs. And then we add the profit we expect. Finally, we produce an estimate that can be sent to you, the client. This is the bid price. Unit 2. Recording 7. Farid Ali? Martini Pools, Giovanni Martini speaking. You sent us an email. Ah, yes, Mr. Martini. I'd like to build a swimming pool, an outdoor pool, in my garden here in Cairo. How much will it cost? Can I just ask you a couple of questions? First of all, what size of swimming pool would you like? About uh, 20 by 10. Is that meters? Yes. So, a rectangle, uh, no curves? Yes, exactly. And what about depth? Say, two meters at the deep end, and then a slope to the shallow end, with uh, three steps at the shallow end. No problem. Have you thought about the type of swimming pool? Gunite, which is very long-lasting, is more expensive than, say, uh, fiberglass or vinyl. Or maybe you want an above-ground pool. Uh, what's gunite? A type of concrete. OK, yes, uh, that sounds great. OK, you'll also need to think about tiles and coping. Coping is what we have on the edge of the pool. There are a lot of options. Stone, poured concrete, precast concrete, tiles. Of course. Well, the price will depend on which you choose. And then there are things like plumbing and electrical equipment to install. Can you explain? Well, you'll need to think about pumps and filtration systems and so on. Ah, uh, I see. Can you tell me something about the location? Excavation costs depend on the type of ground. Hmm. We're on the edge of the city. There is desert behind us. So it's mostly stone and sand, with one or two trees to remove. OK. Is it flat? Uh, no, we're on a hill. OK. One last question. How long will it take? Around two to three months, once we have a building permit. Again, it depends on exactly what you want. Yes, I understand. OK. Well, I have an idea of what you'd like now, but I need to see the site and discuss a few more details with you. Uh, can I visit sometime? Can't you just send me an estimate? Well... Not really. To do this, I need to have more information. I can only give you a very rough estimate. Uh, very rough. Uh, that's OK. So, uh, how much? Can I call you back in ten minutes? I need to do some calculations. Yes, that's fine. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. Bye.
Unit 2. Recording 8. We need to make some modifications to the original plans. What? Why? The new client. He wants us to make some changes. Okay. So tell me, what changes? Well, first he wants to build a floor-to-ceiling aquarium here, on the right. That means strengthening the floor. Okay. How about if I do some calculations and get back to you on that? Yes, I'm okay with that. Thank you. Now, the lighting... What about the lighting? He wants more natural lighting. Do you have any thoughts? I know. Why don't we remove these dividing walls? Yes, good idea. He also wants more space, a more open-plan design, so that fits in nicely. What do you think? Well, they are only partition walls, but we'll need to run the workstation cabling through the floor. Maybe we need to raise the floor? Yes, that's a good point. I'll speak to him again about this. Next thing, he wants better insulation. He thinks it's too noisy. Can you speak to Ahmed about that? Sure. Okay. Now, the joinery. What about the joinery? Well, the doors and windows stay the same, but he wants us to use FSC timber. It's more environmentally friendly. Okay. How about if I speak to the joiners and see what they recommend? Okay. And we need to change the paint. What about the paint? He wants us to use natural paints, no VOCs. Yes, that makes sense. But isn't that more expensive? Yes, he knows. He's okay with that. Okay, I'll organize that. And finally, the air conditioning. He wants us to think about different systems. Systems that are more energy efficient, if possible. Okay. I'll speak to the HVAC people. There's no need. I'm seeing them later today. I'll speak to them. Thank you. Unit 3. Equipment. Recording 9. 1. This machine is for driving piles into the soil. 2. This machine has a bucket, which is used to scoop soil out of the ground. 3. This machine can lift heavy loads high in the air. 4. You use this machine to move large amounts of earth. 5. This machine makes electricity from petrol. 6. This machine is used for transporting concrete to high parts of a construction site. 7. This machine is used to transport people to high parts of a construction site. Unit 3. Recording 10. Hi, Carl. Uh, you asked about the back hoe? A couple of things. One of the mirrors is cracked. I thought it got fixed. Can you put it on the checklist? Yes, I've already done that. And one of the belts was loose. I tightened it. Okay, let's keep an eye on that. Anything else? Well, the first aid kit is missing and the fire extinguisher, too. What? Again? That's the third time this month. I'll speak to the security people. And there's a problem with the hydraulics. Can you come and have a look? Oh? What's up? Look at this. Uh, yes, that's too much oil. Did you check the reservoir? Yes, it's nearly empty. Okay, let's have a look. You got a torch handy? Yeah, uh, just a second. 
Here you are. Ah, I see the problem. What is it? The hose is damaged, here, just behind the tank. Can you see? Yes, I missed that, sorry. Shall I call Muhammad then? No, Muhammad's off sick today. But Farad should be around somewhere. Okay, I'll give him a call. Tell Farad it's urgent. We need the backhoe to dig those trenches. Yes, okay. I'm on it now. Unit 3. Recording 11. Okay, listen up. We need to sort out the office trailer. It's a bit of a mess. Here's what I want you to do. First of all, the roof is leaking. John, can you look at that? Sure, no problem. I'll fix it this afternoon, OK? Yes, that's fine, thanks. Secondly, one of the steps is broken. It needs welding. Sandra? OK, I'll do that right away. It should take me an hour, Tops. Good. Can you look at the jack as well, please? It looks like it needs some grease. It's a two-minute job. Sure. Next, the electrics. Some of the wiring is damaged, so there are no lights. And I don't think the air conditioning is working either. I'll ask the HVAC people to have a look at those. Leave that with me. Ah, and finally, the door. The lock is broken and needs replacing. And one of the hinges needs replacing too. John, can you do those after the roof? Just to clarify, is it just the lock that needs replacing or the handle and key plate as well? Just the lock. There's a broken key in it. It's a mortise lock. OK, no problem. Great. Thanks, everyone. Any more questions? Unit 3. Recording 12. 1. I can't get the Jenny to start. The engine is turning over, so the battery must be all right. 2. There's a problem with the JCB. The temperature gauge is showing red. 3. Listen to the bulldozer. The engine is misfiring. Any ideas what it could be? 4. Have you seen the mechanic? The gauge is showing low pressure, but the oil reservoir is full. 5. Can you look at the crane, please? It's completely dead. There are no lights. Nothing. Unit 4. Materials. Recording 13. There are basically two types of driveway. You can have a firm surface, like stones or concrete or asphalt, and you can have a loose surface of aggregate, like gravel or crushed stone. Each type needs layers of different materials underneath the surface layer and the materials you use for these layers have different properties. So, for example, if you want paving stones, you need a bedding layer underneath, which is normally coarse sand or grit. If the sand is too fine, the bedding layer will be too soft. Under that, you may have a base layer, and underneath that, you may have another layer called a sub-base. This sub-base needs to be strong enough to take the weight of vehicles, like family cars. If this sub-base is too weak, the driveway will subside or sink. These two layers will be aggregates of different sizes. The larger aggregates are at the bottom. The sub-base sits on the sub-grade, in other words, on the existing ground. 
On the outside, you have edgings. The edgings are often stone or concrete. Some edgings, like in children's playgrounds, can be elastic. On driveways, the edgings need to be strong enough to hold the paving together. And they need to be tough. Brittle edgings are no good. They break or chip easily. Edgings also need to look attractive, so it's important to think about things like colour and finish. Otherwise, the finished driveway may look unattractive. You also need to take texture into account. Will the texture be rough or smooth? And then you could also consider whether you want to include any. Unit 4. Recording 14. And when you put down asphalt, you have to think about its properties. The first is the pen value or penetration value, which tells you how hard or soft the asphalt is. The pen value depends on the climate and the local temperatures. If the asphalt is too hard, it will crack. If it's too soft, it will distort or change shape. The second property is cutback, which has to do with how fast the asphalt cures. In other words, how quickly it reaches maximum strength and hardness. Again, this will change depending on local conditions. Another property is porosity, or how much water the asphalt lets through. And then there's noise reduction and reflection. Both of these are important on motorways, but not so important on driveways. Motorways need to be as quiet as possible, particularly in built-up areas, and they mustn't produce glare which can affect a driver's eyes. The dark surface of the asphalt absorbs light and reduces reflection. With an asphalt surface, you don't have a bedding layer, but you do have a binding layer, which holds everything together. Unit 4. Recording 15. 1. Harrogate Solutions, how can I help you? Hi, my name is Abdullah. I'm calling about an order. There are a few problems with it. Do you have the order number? Yes, yes, of course. It's J2356G. Just one moment, please. Uh, can I just confirm your company name, please? Yes, it's Kawasaki Construction. Thank you. Yes, three packages of electrical supplies. It seems that the packages were dispatched at nine this morning. Uh, just one moment. Uh, I'll call up the delivery note. Yes, it was signed for by a Mr. Malik Zahid at 10.05. Malik Zahid? We don't have any one of that name on our site. What was the delivery address? 34 Bridge Street. Ah... Uh, that's the problem. That's not our site. That's a couple of blocks down. It's the same street, but we're at number 12. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'll sort out a new delivery straight away. It should be with you tomorrow. Wait, there is no need. I'll send someone down to see Mr. Zahid. It'll be quicker. I'll call again if I have any problems. Hello? Just one moment, please. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. Ah, good. Thank you. My name's Lopez. Uh, who am I speaking to, please? Christina Dudek. How can I help you? I'm calling about a problem with an order. We ordered some sand. Hasn't it arrived? Yes, yes, it's here. That's not the problem. Is it the wrong sand? 
No, it's the right sand, but it's the wrong quantity. What do you mean? Well, we ordered three 10 kilogram bags and we received three truckloads. So are you saying that we sent you three truckloads? Yes, that's right. No, wait. What? Is that more? Yes, three more. Oh, no. Now we have six truckloads. Three more have just arrived. Where is the sand now? In our car park. Our security guard didn't check the delivery. He just signed for it. Oh, no! Oh, yes! They unloaded six trucks before we could stop them. Did you say unloaded? Oh, no! I am... Three. Hello? Good morning. This is Alano Baldamiro from Savant Contractors. Could you repeat that, please? I didn't catch that. This is Alano Baldamiro from Savant Contractors. Ah, yes. Are you calling about the beams? Yes, exactly. Where are they? We're waiting for them. Yes. Well, the driver just called. He's stuck. Sorry? What do you mean? He's stuck in the mud, and he can't move, he says. Okay. Where is he? I'll send someone to pull him out. He's just off the B391, about a hundred metres down the track to your site. He said he pulled over to let a wide load go past, and then he got stuck. Yes, I think I know the spot. We had another delivery stuck there this morning. Can you tell him we'll be there in about half an hour? Yes, thank you. And uh, one more thing. Yes? Any chance you could do something about the track? We'll be sending you more materials tomorrow. Well, it's the rain, but I take your point. I'll see what I can do. Thanks. Unit 5. Processes. Recording 16. Setting out is basically the process of putting what was on the plan onto the ground. We use various tools and techniques to do this, ranging from simple pegs and ranging poles to sophisticated electronic equipment, depending on the job. It's all about maths. The simplest thing to set out is a straight line. As an example, let's imagine we are setting out a straight line for a new road. Let me explain the process step by step. First, we make sure we have the plans and drawings we need. Next, we get the equipment. The simplest way to set out a straight line is to use three ranging poles and three plumb lines. You also need two people, an observer and an assistant. Let's say that the straight line is to go from point A to point B. The observer and his assistant place the ranging poles at points A and B. It's important to use the plumb lines to make sure that the rods are vertical. Next, the observer stands at point A. The assistant places a third pole at point C, closer to A than to B, and moves it until the observer is satisfied that it is in the correct place. Finally, the line is marked with a series of pegs, say 10 metres apart. For longer distances, more rods can be used. Unit 5 Recording 17. HR, Suzanne Cole speaking. Hi, Suzanne. It's Peter. How's it going? Fine, thanks. Busy as ever. You left me a message to call you. Ah, oh, yes. Have you heard the news about Sally? 
Um, what news? She's pregnant. So? So you'll need a new structural engineer for your team. Ah, yes, of course. When is she planning to leave? She said mid-July. OK. Is she coming back after she has the baby? She'll decide later on, but she may take a couple of years off. Hmm. We'd better think about finding a replacement then. We can't cover for that long. Yes. And even if she does come back, we need extra people in the team anyway. There's a lot to do. OK. So, uh, what's the procedure? Well, first of all, you need to identify the key skills you want her replacement to have. And then we need to prepare, or probably just update, the job description. OK. That's easy enough. Then we need to advertise, first internally, then externally. OK. Then it's a matter of looking at people's CVs, producing a short list and carrying out the interviews. That's it? Well, we'll also need to check references before we make our final decision. And then we inform the successful applicant and organise the induction. OK. Uh, look, why don't we meet next Monday to talk about the key skills you mentioned? Just a second. Let me check my diary. Yes, OK. That sounds good. Three o'clock? Perfect. See you then. Unit 5. Recording 18. This is what we used to do. Every day, we got hundreds of invoices from different suppliers. These went straight to the accounts department. Let's imagine that the invoice was for some materials, say, a load of sand. The first thing they did was match the invoice with the purchase order to check that we had ordered the sand and the delivery note to check that the sand had been received. If the documents did not match, the invoice was sent back to the supplier. If they did match, the accounts department sent the invoice together with the purchase order and the delivery note to the project manager for approval. Once the invoice was approved, the accounts department entered the details into the books and filed the invoices in the accounts payable file. The payment was then dealt with, normally by bank transfer, within 30 days of receipt of the invoice. The invoices then went into the paid invoices file. These files were kept for 10 years. Unit 5. Recording 19. That's the way we used to do it. Nowadays, the system is all on computer. When the invoice comes in, it goes to the accounts department, as before. They type the process order number into the system and scan in the invoice. They also type in the date of the payment, the invoice number and the amount to be paid. The system then checks whether or not the invoice is for the right amount and if it has been approved. If everything is OK, the authorization is given for payment to be made. It's much easier, much faster and there are fewer mistakes. Unit 6. Projects. Recording 20. Welcome to this kick-off meeting. I just want to clarify some points about how I see this project running. <coughs> First of all, I want to stress the importance of the project plan, which is this document, and which covers all aspects of the project. <coughs> Among other things, it outlines the scope. In other words, the work that needs to be done in order for the project to be completed successfully. 
all of us need to be very familiar with this document. In fact, by the end of next week, I expect us all to know this document better than our own partners. <laughs> the second document is the WBS or work breakdown structure. This splits the work into smaller elements, which are easier to manage in terms of resources, costs, and so on. Each of you will be responsible for your own elements in the WBS, but it's important that you see the big picture too. <laughs> Unit 6. Recording 21. <clears throat> As I see it, I'm really concerned with three issues. Cost, in other words, keeping to budget. Time, or keeping to the schedule and meeting our deadlines. And scope, which is, as I explained earlier, the work that needs to be done. <coughs> A change in one of these issues affects the other two. Don't get me wrong, I know changes will happen. Change is part of any project. <clears throat> My main job is to continually monitor what's happening so that I know where we are in terms of the project plan and so that I can fix any problems. Unit 6. Recording 22. 1. We need to get the roof finished before the rainy season starts. 2. We need to get the roof finished before the rainy season starts. 3. We need to get the roof finished before the rainy season starts. 4. We need to get the roof finished before the rainy season starts. 5. We need to get the roof finished before the rainy season starts. Unit 6. Recording 23. Thank you all for coming at such short notice. What I want to talk about is communication. Things are not going well. I know that we're all very busy and that we're all members of other project teams. I also understand that we all come from different companies and have different ways of working, but we need to improve our communication. Otherwise, we are never going to meet all our deadlines and finish this project on time. I've discussed the communication problem with the directors and we feel there are a number of things we can do to solve the problem. First of all, we need to have more meetings, face-to-face -face or at least online. Secondly, we all use the intranet already, so we have decided to set up a new portal which will include project updates, documentation, Gantt charts, that is to say, project schedules, and tools and templates. There will also be information about team members, specialists, previous experience, and so on. We basically need to get to know each other better. And finally, the HR department has contacted a company who will organise team building activities for us, which I will tell you about later. Again, this will help us work better as a team. Unit 6. Recording 24. What about types of contracts? There are many different types of contracts. What do you mean? Well, let's take the simplest contract, a lump sum contract. In this contract, the client agrees to pay a fixed amount of money for the finished product. I see. 
So the client knows exactly how much the project will cost. Yes, exactly. But if there are any problems, the contractor has to pay the extra costs. The contractor is taking the risk. I see. So it's good for the client. Not always. A contractor might use cheap materials to lower the costs. Ah,、oh, okay. What other types are there? Another type is a cost plus contract. This means that the client pays all the costs of the project, plus extra payment, so that the contractor makes a profit. I see. And how is the extra payment calculated? There are different ways. For example, in a cost plus fixed fee contract, the client covers all the costs, including any cost overruns. But the contractor only gets a fixed fee, so there is an incentive to finish the job quickly. Okay. You could also have a cost plus fixed fee plus a bonus for work that is finished ahead of time, or a bonus for any savings that the contractor makes, and so on. Yes, yes, of course. And then there are turnkey projects. Turnkey.、Uh, turnkey means that one person or company is responsible for all the work. Normally, a client has to work with a designer, such as an architect, and a contractor, who is responsible for the building. In a turnkey solution, the client only has to speak to one person, who is responsible for the whole project, and at the end gives the key to the client. Nice and simple. Unit Seven, Documentation, Recording Twenty Five. This room is, in a way, the heart of the company. Everything comes into or goes out from here. What do you mean? Well, our company deals with hundreds of documents relating to all the different projects. You know, documents such as correspondence, job site memos. Change orders, reports, drawings, RFI logs, procedures, and so on. So, document control is very important. All documents come through this room. These people, the document controllers, are responsible for looking after the documents so that they are in the right place at the right time, or can be accessed whenever they are needed. Any delays cost money. I see. Um, you said RFI logs. Oh yes,、uh, RFI stands for Request for Information. It's a document that asks for information about specific details in a project, and an RFI log is a list of the RFIs. Ah,、oh, yes, of course. But isn't it all done on computer? Well, yes and no. Yes. We do use computers, of course, but no, because we still get a lot of documentation which isn't in electronic format, so that has to be processed manually. Of course, we scan a lot of documentation, but that takes time: logging it in, giving it a serial number, tracking it so that we know where it is, making sure it gets booked out to the right person. Making copies or backups,、uh, that sort of thing. I see. But、uh, I think we'll have to change to a better system soon. It's not only processing this volume of documents that takes time, but also managing all the amendments. There are always draft versions of documents which need to be replaced or updated. If we had a fully integrated system, I'm sure things would be faster and more efficient. What's in that room over there? Ah, those are the archives. We have to keep certain documents for up to three years, according to the law. We also keep confidential documents in there, in a safe. Unit Seven, Recording Twenty Six. First, you have to type in a password. Okay, good. So this is a typical document. You can see the first button on the top left says 
details. That's the document's serial number and document type, a drawing, a memo, an agenda, or whatever. And the next button is the status. If you click on status, you get two options, draft or final. Yes, OK. And next to it is the confidentiality level button. We have three levels. Restricted documents can only be seen by certain people. Internal documents are for our use only. And open documents, which anyone can see. Uh-huh, all right. Moving across, you can see the originator button, which is normally someone's name, but it could also be a department, and their contact telephone number and email address. Then there's the document history button, which is a list of the different versions of the documents, together with dates and the people involved. OK. And if you click this button, you get the document output menu. We can set different possibilities. For example, only allow online viewing, or transfer files, or print. And for special documents, like big drawings, we can click here, and that sends the drawing straight to the printer. I see. Unit 7. Recording 27. Hi, Vince. It's Thomas. Thomas. What's up? I just received some changes to some of the drawings. I thought I'd phone and tell you. Can't you just send them? Yes, but they wouldn't get to you before this afternoon. And you're already working on the foundations, aren't you? The foundations? They want changes to the foundations? Only minor amendments. Don't worry. I hope so. Okay, I'll just get the drawings. Which ones do I need? The drawing number is GF-400-013. Well... It says 013, but it should be 003. Foundations, warehouse, the third row on the schedule of drawings. You need the general notes for that. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, got them. 003, not 013. Okay. What are the other changes? You see note 2, load-bearing walls? The specs have been modified. Note 2, load-bearing walls. Got it? It should read 250 millimeters thick, not 200. Okay. 250, not 200. Anything else? Yes, note 3, Roman numeral 2. They think that the blinding ratios should be 1 to 3 to 6, not to 5. Okay, 1 to 3 to 6. And they call these minor changes, huh? <laughs> the next one is minor, uh, very minor. You see the abbreviation in Note 6? There's a typo. Yeah, yeah. It should read BS, not GS. No problem. Anything else? The semicolon at the end of Note 6 should be a full stop. Yes, yes. Okay. And you see the plumbing legend? And you see the plumbing key? Bottom right-hand corner? Yes. There is nothing wrong with it. You'll get the revised drawings this afternoon. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. And it's a good thing you called. We were just starting to mix the cement. I saved you a bit of time, then. <laughs> yes. Right. Gotta go.
I need to sort this out ASAP. Unit 7. Recording 28. Ministry of Public Works, Alexandra Puccini speaking. Hello. Is that the Ministry of Public Works? Yes, that's right. How can I help you? I'd like to speak to somebody about a tender we'd like to submit. One moment, please. I'll put you through to Hamish Campbell. Thank you. Hello, Hamish Campbell speaking. Hello, Mr. Candle. My name is Mustafa Mohammed Al Najashi. I'd like to speak to someone about the tender. The name's Campbell, not Candle. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Campbell. No problem. A tender. Do you have a project number? Yes, it's KZH eight nine seven. KZH eight nine seven. One moment, please. Ah, yes. It's to do with a tunnel refurbishment on Highway 36. Yes, that's right. How can I help you? It's about an email which I sent you on the 27th of May, confirming that my company would like to bid for the project and asking for more information. But uh, I haven't received anything, and I believe the submission date is next week. What did you say your name was? Mustafa Mohammed Al Najashi. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, Mr. Al Najashi. Is it your company which is doing the bridge refurbishment on the same highway? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, I remember. Uh, ah, I found it now. We sent you a reply asking for your postal address. But I'm afraid the email bounced back. Bounced back? Yes, the address is unknown. Ha, uh, wait a minute. Uh, what email address did you send it to? mman at psl dot net. Ah, no, no. Uh, that email address is no good. It's been changed. <laughs> I'm sorry. My new address is M-M-A-N at P-S-L dot com. I see. No problem. You're still in time if you'd like to submit a tender. Thank you. Uh, will you send me the necessary information? Yes, but I do need your postal address first. I'd like to send you the information pack, but it's not available in digital format. Uh, snail mail, I'm afraid. Oh, of course. It's, um, are you ready? Unit 8. Health and Safety. Recording 29. So, to recap, here are the five most important things I have covered in today's talk. First of all, hazardous waste. Waste needs to be sorted properly and dealt with properly. Just follow the instructions and take proper precautions. Next, falls, which is one of the most common accidents. People fall off scaffolding, off ladders, off roofs. Don't climb on things which aren't fixed properly. And don't cut corners. Take your time. Don't forget, height can kill. Third, cranes and loads which are just as dangerous. People either fall off things or things fall on them. Keep your eyes open. And remember, don't rig loads unless you are trained to do it. Next, watch out when trucks are loading or unloading. As I said, last year three people on sites near here died by being buried alive. One of them was buried in sand just like this. And finally, PPE, Personal Protective Equipment. We give you this equipment because it helps to keep you safe. Remember, use the equipment. Wear your hard hat. Follow the recommendations. Any questions?
Unit 8. Recording 30. Right, listen up. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to park the vehicle just in front of the work area to give us protection from oncoming traffic. Bob, I want you and Ali to put out the signs. Put out the keep right sign first and then the road narrows sign and lastly the roadworks sign. Make sure the first roadworks sign is at least 50 metres away from the end of the taper. That's the wide end, not the narrow end. Do our side of the road first and then the other side, OK? Good. The rest of you will put out the cones. I'll stay in the middle and do the barrier. We need at least five metres between the cones and the taper needs to be around 25 metres long. Start from the kerb and face the traffic as you work. The volume of traffic here isn't very high, but it's better to be safe. And don't forget to keep the safety zone clear. Any questions about that? Unit 8. Recording 31. 1. A friend of mine had white finger syndrome from using vibrating power tools. He lost all feeling in his hands. Sounds painful. 2. I had an accident last year. I tripped over a cable and fell. I put out my arm to stop myself and broke my wrist. Ouch! I bet that hurt. 3. I saw an accident this morning. One of the labourers dropped a load of bricks on his foot. He was only wearing sandals, not safety boots, which didn't help. What? I'll speak to the manager. Everyone needs boots. 4. Back injuries are very common. People lift things which are too heavy. Straight back, bend the knees. That's what I always say. 5. One of the drivers was hit by a truck. He wasn't wearing his high-vis vest and the other driver didn't see him. The bumper hit his leg just below his knee and fractured it. I bet he wears his vest from now on. 6. People don't use ear protection and then damage their hearing. It's a gradual process, so they're not aware of what's happening. Pardon? What did you say? Copyright Pearson Education Limited 2012